Probably one of the worst things you could do when evangelizing to anyone is to use the word sin. It's a word that has no meaning to anyone except Christians. Jesus never used it, but this is what he did do. Okay, before I get a busload of angry Christians pulling up verses stating that I'm wrong in my conclusions, let me just say that yes, sin exists. Yes, the church needs to do a better job of utilizing that word, and yes, God, Jesus, and the Bible do talk about sin, but not to the non-believers. Let me explain with a caveat preceding my explanation to set the mood. The Bible as a whole is primarily meant for Christians, especially the letters of Paul and the other apostles. The books were mainly collected for the church and the body of believers during the first century and present believers. Non-believers won't know what errors we Christians are talking about as they are in the world. If you closely read the New Testament and examine who Jesus and the writers were talking to, you will see that there is a distinction between non-believers and disciples. All of the letters of Paul, Peter, James, and the other apostles were written to the various churches and believers scattered throughout the regions, and they were meant to be read to believers only. These letters were meant to inform, edify, correct, and in some cases rebuke Christians by calling their behaviors errors or sin. The biggest mistake, and this is just my opinion, that I see is non-believers having access to things that are meant for Christians. Not that they, non-believers, are undeserving, but that the majority of the text is meant for Christians and can be understood by Christians only because of the Holy Spirit. As a side note, this puts a different spin on things, especially when bad stuff was happening in the church that was quite sinful. All of the things about adultery, fornication, gluttony, and the like were directed towards Christians. Non-believers, when doing these things, are fulfilling their job description, as it were, and correcting them, calling them sinners, and their acts sinful, brings into play the law. Paul wrote quite a bit concerning the law of God and what effect it would have on those outside of the body of Christ found in Romans chapter 7. For when we are in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the flesh were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Romans chapter 7 verse 5. When we use the word sin, we, Christians, are using the law of God as a standard, and the law itself stirs up sin. In a nutshell, Christians are not doing anyone any favors by bringing the law to a criminal. Okay, but didn't Jesus use the word sin in his ministry? Nope. Again, we have to look at who Jesus was talking to, if he ever used the word at all. When Jesus rebuked anyone, it was either the Pharisees, Sadducees, or his disciples, or the house of Israel because they knew better having access to the law or the master. Hey, if you don't believe me, believe the Gospels that are listed below. Jesus will use the word repent a lot, but we'll get into that word and what it means in a bit. When we look at scripture, the ones listed below, the commissions found throughout the Gospels can be divided up into what I call the minor and major commissions. The minor commissions were given to Jesus' disciples before he died on the cross and resurrected on the third day. You can also read the various evangelisms done by various apostles and disciples in the book of Acts, and they did not use the word sin. The best analogy of our situation in the first century church can be found with Paul's discussion with the Greeks, but you'll also note that Paul never used the S word. When I worked at the animal shelter, I encountered dogs that had known nothing but kennel life. A dog in a kennel has to contend with poo and pee in its space, and space is very low. They have to deal with a concrete floor and the smell of waste from other animals, not to mention the noise. All they get is a blanket, toys, food, water, and they volunteer to play with them if they're lucky. Now I, and others, Know that a dog's life in an animal shelter is not as great as it would be in a good forever home. But the dog doesn't know it. All the dog knows is its temporary shelter is the life it has now. It has no basis of comparison. 
While I'm not comparing an unbeliever to a dog, the situations are the same. Believers know what life is like with the kingdom of heaven residing within us. Believers know the purest form of joy, peace, love, and the other fruits of the Holy Spirit. Believers know that God is now our Father and not a judge to be feared. We were taken out of our kennels and escorted to our new forever home in the here and now as well as the hereafter by the gentle hand of Jesus Christ who willingly paid for our adoption with his obedience and his blood. Unbelievers are still in their particular kennels, their lives, and they think things are hunky-dory. Okay, so I've made my point. So what do we do with this? Well, we do what Jesus did. We tell them to stop and turn around from the destructive path that they are on. In other words, Jesus told them to repent and we should do the same. Every time I talked with an inmate at our jail, I never used the word sin, but instead talked about the path that they were on and posed questions like, how do you see this ending? Or are you better off? Or are you truly where you want to be? I would tell them that I don't fear or have any worries about anything, that I can go to sleep at night without doubt or worry, and that I don't feel like the other shoe is about to drop. For them, the lost, this is a foreign state. Those questions in the world of the spirit removes obstacles and willingly brings the lost individual into the light where they get to hear about their own heart. From those questions, I bring Jesus down to them, just as God did for us. He met us in our state. I saw more response using this approach, this non-invasive approach, than saying, you're a sinner and you need Jesus. It also helped when I showed them the love and power of the Lord by laying hands on them and healing them of sickness by the power of God. Pose questions. Tell unbelievers about what being a child is like. Then offer them the story of Jesus, the full story, about why he willingly went to the cross, even when we didn't want anything to do with God. All disciples are as glorified seed scatterers, always in season with the word so we can give a reason for the hope that lies within each one of us, and that they, non-believers, can have true joy, peace, love, and other fruits of the Holy Spirit as well as the kingdom of God when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. All Christians are to do is to cast a net. Let God, Jesus, worry about picking out the bad fish.